Good afternoon, and welcome to our New York Archives Magazine online speaker series. I'm Josie Madison, editor of New York Archives. Today, we're joined by Claire Fleming and Tom Ruller for our program, Mapping the Empire State, Discover New York Through 10,000 Plus Maps Preserved at the State Archives. Claire Fleming holds an MS in Archives Management and an MA in Photographic Preservation and Collections Management. She is both a staff member at the Archives Partnership Trust and a reference archivist at the New York State Archives, as well as adjunct professor at the University at Albany in the Information Science Master's Program. Claire is the project manager on a grant to conserve and digitize a set of our Schillner maps, exquisite and massive hand-ruled maps created in 1896 to document the structures of the Erie, Champlain, and Oswego canals. Tom Ruller has held the position of New York State Archivist since 2015. He has been an active professional and is the author of several peer-reviewed journal articles and reviews on the use of technology in archives and the preservation of records in electronic form. He's been a consultant for several state governments and other organizations focusing on electronic records management and preservation. So for those of you who have joined us today, there will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So you can feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end of the presentation. And without further ado, I am pleased to introduce Claire Fleming and Tom Ruller. Thank you very much, Josie. And hello, Claire. Hi, Tom. This should be a pretty fun and uh, I think hopefully engaging and informative program. You know, we, we put the title together for this, and we said discovering over 10,000 maps at the New York State Archives. The truth is we have over 80,000 maps in our collection that cover all kinds of, of topics and all from all kinds of sources. We'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, what uh, another interesting thing that I was thinking about as we were starting this presentation off, in 20 years time, We'll still be able to talk about some of these paper and historic maps, but we're really going to start to have to talk about electronic maps, geographic information systems, and the complex ways that scientists, geologists, uh, the people who are building our roads and bridges document the same kinds of structures that many of our maps and drawings document today. So, but that's a future program. And uh, so today we'll just talk about the 80,000 plus items in the state archives. Probably one of the best ways to do this is through a PowerPoint. So I've got a set of slides. We have a set mm -hmm. of slides uh, that'll illustrate some of our map collections, but also talk a lot about how do you get access to these things. Again, with 80,000 maps and 33 miles of other records, uh, there's a lot of information maintained in the state archives. And the key to being able to access those is working with an archivist, exploring our online finding aids and other things. And we'll talk about that a little bit today. So uh, being the gifted technologist that I am, I'm going to fumble my way through sharing my screen. So bear with me and uh, we'll make this happen. And uh, first step is, Share screen. So with that, hopefully everyone uh, is able to see this. This is our program, Mapping the Empire State, Discovering the Maps Preserved by the New York State Archives. I think it's important for us to start off by saying, what is the State Archives? The New York State Archives, located in Albany, is the state agency charged with uh, collecting, preserving, and making available the historic records of New York's colony and state. Again, 33 miles of records dating from uh, 1630 to the modern day, covering all kinds of formats, photographs, maps, plans, drawings, parchments, uh, from all kinds of functions, courts, the prisons, the operation of state services like the state mental hospitals, the uh, oversight of the New Netherland colony. All of those resources are preserved and made available at the state archives. You can use them in our research room, which is open from nine o'clock in the morning, or I'm sorry, 9.30 in the morning till four o'clock in the afternoon, Monday through Friday. Um, it's a free service. These are the people's records. These are your records, which we preserve in the Cultural Education Center. There's a photo of the Cultural Education Center here in downtown Albany. 
Coming to Albany isn't a requirement though to use the records that we have. We do a lot of work digitizing records and delivering them to researchers across the state, across the country, really across the globe. Um, some research does require you to come here and go through the boxes of materials like the folks here in this photo, but a lot of requests can be satisfied by talking to a reference archivist like Claire um, and asking for something specific and we're often able to digitize and send it, send it to you. But how do you discover what's in the archives? The, the gateway to what's happening and what access to both the records that we have, but also the services that we perform is our website, www.archives.nysed.gov. This is our homepage. The area that we're gonna focus on mostly today is the research area. That's where you discover what records we have in the state archives. Every single set of records, we call them a record series, every single set of records that we have in our collection has at least a minimal description. Many records have much more detailed and in-depth descriptions that allow you to get down to the box level or in some cases the folder level. And in the case of those Dutch manuscripts, it's about 13,000 specific documents, you can get down to the individual document level. It's pretty impressive. The State Archives provides other services and supports. Uh, we work with state agencies and local governments to manage their records that might not be coming to the State Archives. State Archives really only preserves about 5% of the records that are generated by state government. And we don't preserve local government records. Those are the responsibilities of the local governments themselves. But we provide assistance through grants and technical support. We do quite a bit of work with preservation. We provide services to non-government repositories across the state, training and uh, help for them to be able to describe and preserve and do what they need to do to make sure that the records in their care are adequately protected. I mentioned the grants. We do an, a lot of uh, workshops and training. Um, and we have a pretty robust education program, a support program for teachers and students. Claire's gonna talk a little bit about that later on in our presentation. But I wanna talk a little bit about how do you search for records in the state archives. Under that research tab, there's an option to search for records. And there are a number of different ways of getting at things. One is under research topics, we've collected a lot of different information about a particular topic. For example, land records um, or prisons or the Dutch or the military history, um, where it'll guide you through the kinds of records that satisfy that particular topic. The most important area to look at is our finding aids. The finding aids are where we provide a basic description uh, as well as detailed descriptions where they're available of all of the materials that are in the state archives. There are about 8,000 finding aids or 8,000 different sets of records in our collection. That's completely searchable, it's navigable. I'm gonna show you a quick example of what uh, finding aid looks like um, if we if we have time. Uh, but the finding aids is really the key to discovering what's in the state archives. It's very user friendly, very easy to use. Our online catalog, which we share with the state library, provides basic card catalog information about the records in the archives. Our digital collections is another tremendously valuable resource. And some of the maps we're going to look at today are also reflected as digital files in our digital collections. That digital collections is also fully searchable. It doesn't contain a, a more than maybe a couple hundred thousand documents from our collection, a very small sample of what's in the state archives. But all of those files are available for download. We've scanned them at archival quality scanning levels so that you can use them in publications or anywhere. It's a tremendously valuable resource. You don't need to talk to an archivist to discover things, uh, but sometimes an archivist will help you find what's in there. We operate a number of indexes, uh, including name indexes, which provide information on individual names of indiv people who are reflected in the records that we have. That's a tremendously valuable resource for those of you who are doing genealogy or biographical work or something like that. The State Archives has uh, over nearly 50,000 individual case files of film scripts. Um, for any film that was shown in New York State between 1924 and 1964, uh, we have a case file where they applied for a license 
those case files include the scripts of all of those films. So we're talking about, like I say, 50,000 films that were shown here in New York during that, that period so that the folks could determine whether or not those films were appropriate to be shown here in New York. It's a very heavily used and very interesting and valuable and unique resource. And then finally, we try to keep everyone up to date on new records that have come into the archives through our list of new accessions. So that's what the State Archives is all about. And that's how you get access to us. Go through our website, give us a call, ask us a question. We're here to make it possible for you, the researchers, to gain access to the records we have. And some of those records look like this. This, this map is one of my favorites. Um, this, this is the planning map. This was the map drawn uh, about 10 years, maybe 15 years, before they flooded the Sacandaga River Valley, where they projected where the Great Sacandaga Lake would fill in. The tremendous amount of engineering work that went into figuring out where that lake was going to show up is really so well reflected in this map. Again, this map was prospective before they built the Conklinville Dam and created this massive lake. But it's a great and tremendously valuable resource for understanding the communities that were flooded, for looking at where the original Sacandaga River was. Um, it's, it's just a, it's a wonderful example of a beautiful map um, of what has now become a very beautiful part of, of our state. It was a beautiful part of our state to begin with, uh, but now it's a very heavily uh, used for recreation. Just, I wanna dive a little bit in on this map in particular, because I know this area pretty well. I grew up uh, near the Sacandaga Reservoir. You can see the line for the railroad that served the Northville, which is at the very north end of the lake. Um, that railroad line is now all but it is abandoned um, and much of it is underwater. You can see the names of the small communities that were flooded. You can identify some of the locations of the cemeteries that where bodies were exhumed and moved to other locations. And you can get a sense of the elevations around the lake and the depths of the lake, uh, which you wouldn't ordinarily uh, be able to do. It's a really beautiful, beautiful resource with a lot of information in it. That's what maps do. They tell us a lot about the physical environment, um, the natural environment, and the human environment, all of that collected in one place. Uh, that's why we're so happy to be able to preserve and make many of these maps available. So where are the cartographic resources in, uh, in the State Archives? We organize our records based on who created them. So uh, in this case, we want to know what state government agencies were responsible for generating a lot of the maps that we're going to talk about today and uh, many of the maps that we're not going to talk about today. Of course, it's very easy and logical to know that the New York State engineer and surveyor uh, created an enormous amount of the, the maps. And that some of those maps are, uh, are pretty old. Uh, you can note from our PowerPoint, 1686 is the earliest uh, set of maps. Uh, from the New York State Engineer and Surveyor. Now, of course, it wasn't the New York State Engineer and Surveyor, it was the Colonial uh, Surveyor General, uh, but those records continue to be uh, kept and maintained by that agency. So we'll talk a little bit about those records, but I want you to pay attention to a couple of things here. One, the creating agency, the New York State Engineer and Surveyor. Two, that number, A4016. That's what we call a series number here at the State Archives. That's a key to identifying that large collection of materials that were generated in this particular function. So that's a record series, A4016, the New York State Engineer and Surveyor Records of Surveys and Maps of State Lands. That's the communication that you give to the archivist when you're looking for particular maps from this particular set of records. Another set of records, um, or another source of, of creation of a lot of maps, is the New York State Land Commissioners, series number B2321. It's the New York State Commissioner of the Land Office land, Lands Underwater Application Files. The state had uh, ownership of lands underwater, so if individuals needed to build a dock or do some kind of interaction with a body of water that touched their land, they needed to apply to the state land commissioners. This is a function that continues on to this day. And uh, 
So they had to supply maps, a justification, and a plan for what they wanted to do. So there are a lot of much smaller scale maps for individual parcels of land across the state in series B2321. Another set of maps really are drawn out of a set of records uh, from the state letters patent from the New York State Department of State or the Secretary of State's office. Series 12943, uh, the state letters patent. And you can see that's a function that continues to this day, but it dates from 1664. So these are really valuable records to understand land ownership and property ownership, uh, but they contain not just the information on the awarding of the patent uh, or the grant of the land by the state to an individual or a, a group, but they also include a map or several maps relating to, to that patent. There were a number of very large patents across the state. Um, we're going to show a little map of, of one of them, uh, the Totten and Crossfield patent, um, at least a piece of it. Uh, but that's one example of these large tracts of land that were awarded to individuals. One of the, to go back to the Sacandaga Lake, an important patent that was granted there was the Sacandaga patent granted by the king to Sir William Johnson in the mid of the 18th century. Another incredibly valuable resource and large producer of maps were the canal commissioners. Now the Erie, Oswego, and other canals across the state were operated by a series of state agencies or commissions. Um, so I'm just lumping them all under the canal commissioners. But there are a lot of maps related to structures, to the development of the canal itself. We'll talk a little bit about some of the great maps there um, and a lot of documentation of individual pieces of the of the canal. Uh, the Erie Canal, I don't need to tell everyone what it's all about, but it's an enormous, enormous public works uh, project that touched the entire state. Um, so those canal commissioners needed a lot of geographic and cartographic information in order to build this enormous structure, which was initially built between 1817 and 1826, and then ultimately redone and enlarged in the 1850s. And then now there is the modern barge canal, which uh, was completed in 1918. All of those activities generated maps. And then another uh, principal source for maps are the Department of Transportation. So the series uh, B1804, the highway corridor maps, Again, moving from canals to uh, 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 various other public works, the highway corridor maps talk about the development of the highway system across the state and the state highways. Uh, so it's a tremendously valuable resource because it's not just the road, but it's also the surrounding parcels. So you've got a number of sources where some of these maps show up or many of the larger collections of maps appear. But there are other sources of maps. Um, one small set of records is the Forfeited Lands of Loyalists, Series A4032. The New York State Commissioners of for Forfeitures lists of sales and accounts of payment for confiscated lands. So again, after the Revolutionary War, the state confiscated the land of those individuals who were loyalists um, and then redistributed those lands. That required maps to be made. So that's another really important set of, of records. There are a lot of records related to state facilities and state parks. Series 18552, the New York State Department of Public Works, the Real Estate Division Director's Right of Way map tracings, uh, 1900 to 1945. These are fairly large, relatively fragile maps, uh, but they're a tremendously valuable resource for understanding how the state established a right of way across this in lots of different situations, including in state parks. Series A1346, the Conservation Commission recommendations to the commissioners of the land office on land purchases for New York State Parks. So all the parks that we enjoy today, at some point, the state tried, attempted to purchase the land or needed to purchase the land. Uh, so they made maps of what those land purchases were, or the, those, the land that they were looking at was. Another really important series of records. And then finally, military patents. 
Series A0447, the New York State Department of State military patents granted uh, oftentimes uh, in many cases to individuals who served in the state militia um, and the, the state awarded patents to them for lands, Western New York, and in some cases in the Adirondacks. So a number of different places. Maps aren't all in one place. There's not one big vertical file of maps. They show up in sets of records that perform different functions. I want to talk a little bit more about the canal maps and the series of maps that sort of help us understand and document the Erie Canal. So in 1817, the original maps of the Erie Canal survey show the proposed route of the canal. And then I, I won't read all of these, but there are a number of really important maps. And we're going to talk a little bit about the Holmes Hutchinson maps that were done af after the original Erie Canal was constructed. And then the Schilner maps, which are very large scale, and they show the enlarged canal system with the rights of way. Claire is going to talk a little bit about some work that we've done with those Schilner maps uh, more, most recently to improve their accessibility and utility uh, to people. Um, and again, there are thousands of maps of individual sections of the canal. Uh, it's, it's a really tremendously valuable resource. This is one of the Holmes Hutchinson maps. Uh, this is um, out near Rome. You can see Wood Creek. Um, so if you're familiar with the Cary, um, where Fort Stanwix uh, is, uh, you're vaguely familiar with this particular section of, of New York State. Um, you can see the kinds of detail that are here, um, not just the, the specific scientific or, or, not, or cartographic notations, the elevations, et cetera, but also the locations of various structures uh, that were there. There was a dam with a sawmill, the, the United States arsenal that was located out there, and then there's the, the Rome Canal, uh, which intersected with the Erie Canal, um, out near Wood Creek. So that series A0848, um, a really incredibly valuable and beautiful set of records. Almost all of series A0848 has been digitized and is available on the State Archives website in our digital collections. So again, all of those maps are they're there for you to look at, to enjoy, to download. You can download the high resolution copy. Um, and uh, if you're a real collector and like to have beautiful maps, you can download one, bring it to your uh, local photo store print shop, and uh, you can have one of these beautiful historical maps hanging in your living room. You know, what, one of the things that's interesting to think about maps when we look at all the notations on here are the, the lengths and the, uh, you know, the elevations, et cetera. We thought it might be interesting just to show you, this is an artifact from the Smithsonian Institution used by surveyors. These are the chains. You hear about the distances or the lengths of particular things. These are the chains that were reflected in the word chains. These are the chains that were used to measure some distance uh, and a long distance um, out in the field by surveyors. So when you when they say you know it's 50 chains from the big large boulder, that's what they were using. Literally, they were using chains. This is the other uh, Erie Canal uh, or canal map that I wanted to talk a little bit about. The Schilner maps. These are very large scale maps, uh, but they are of the enlarged canal. These were all done in the 1890s before the Barge Canal was constructed. Um, again, Claire's going to talk uh, quite a bit more about what we're doing to help improve the accessibility and utility of these. But interesting, this is the exact same area of the previous Holmes Hutchinson map. You see Wood Creek here, this, the, the, the um, federal arsenal, um, but you can also see the development of that part of the state over the course of the 70 years between the, the Hutchinson maps and the Schilner maps. It's a great way of seeing the evolution of the state um, and how it has grown and changed. And there's also a lot more information here, the location of some of these streets that may no longer exist. Um, and in some cases, although it's not really reflected here on this map, uh, the names of individuals who might have lived in those houses. In many cases, these maps don't have a lot of detail about 
individual owners or individual parcels. Uh, but they are, again, tremendously beautiful, uh, but also very, very informative. In the 1870s, the state commissioned a, uh, a, a survey of the Adirondack Park. Um, uh, that activity, the Adirondack Survey, lasted from around the mid-1870s until the 1890s. And they produced a lot of maps and field books and other notes about the Adirondacks, largely to understand what the natural resources were up there. This is a, a wonderful representation. It's not a super accurate map, but it's a pretty darn accurate map of Blue Mountain Lake. Um, Don, in uh, it's probably the 1875, 1877 period, a uh, fellow named Verplank Colvin was the individual who was responsible for leading the Adirondack survey during that time. This is another uh, map from the Adirondack survey. And I mentioned the patents. These, these are where different sources of maps or different purposes of maps sort of connect to each other. There's the, the maps of patents uh, that are connected there. And then there are uh, maps that reflect where those patents show up in other contexts. This is from, again, the Adirondack Survey, the very far western edge of the Totten and Crossfield patent where it connects to uh, the Macomb Purchase. Again, beautiful, beautiful resources with a lot of information on it. This is an 1878 map um, where, and again, they give you the scale, they give you information on who's there. Um, a lot of it just penciled in, but tremendously valuable and rich resources. This is a good example of one of the maps that's supplied with the lands underwater applications that I mentioned. This is obviously down on Staten Island, um, but the individuals who wanted to do something on this particular set of land um, needed and, and to get permission from the state. They wanted to, uh, they had to get permission from the state. So they reflected it on a map. So again, I don't know the exact period of this particular map, but again, a tremendously rich resource with information on the changing environment, the request to modify the environment. In this case, they're looking at building a bulkhead and perhaps uh, building a pier um, off of the shoreline there. Uh, so it's great, great uh, and very beautiful resource. Maps come in different forms and for different purposes. This is a map used by something called the Lusk Commission, which existed uh, shortly after World War I. Um, the mission of the Lusk Commission was to address what were perceived as the challenges presented by communism. This is an ethnic map of Manhattan Island. And it looks like uh, the, the lower part of the Bronx. Uh, but it's a really interesting map from a lot of different perspectives. Um, it's interesting from its evidential value about what the state was worried about and thinking about and how it may or may not have interacted with different ethnic groups around the state. But it's also an interesting sort of time period uh, to understand the, the diversity of New York City and the various communities across the, across the city. Um, it's a, looking at it from the positive perspective, it is a great way of understanding how the city has changed and evolved over time. But it's not a map that shows up in letters patent or lands underwater. It's a map that shows up in a collection of records of a state investigation commission. This is one of those Department of Transportation uh, maps of the uh, rights of way and uh, the highway maps. Um, it's uh, a lot of detail, particularly on the topography um, and some information on the particular structures that are there. It doesn't provide names of the structures or names associated with those structures. But again, it's a very useful and valuable way of understanding the environment as well as the human constructed elements of the environment. These are relatively modern records. So let's talk a little bit about uh, how do you find these maps uh, a little bit more within the collections of the state archives. I'll talk a little bit about this and then I'm gonna turn it over to Claire who will talk a little bit about both uh, our Schilner map project and, uh, and some of the other activities that we're doing to support use and access to maps. 
So first, uh, you know, there's I'll walk through most of these. Our land records research topic. It's sort of a primer on where all these land records and maps and other information on land ownership can be found. All of these resources are available on our website, with the exception of Nix's catalog. Our real property records pathfinder. Again, it's a primer on how to find ownership or information on a particular parcel of real property. Probate records pathfinder is equally important because so often the transfer of property happened via the probate process. Where are those records? How do I understand them? And how do I access them and use them? Individual finding aids and name indexes are great ways of identifying whether or not an individual shows up in a map um, or where uh, exploring lar those larger collections of maps that I listed at the beginning. And then individual finding aids and indexes for specific series. So some of these collections of maps, there are five or 10,000 individual maps. There's a separate index to them that the archivist who you would work with will help you identify whether or not the map you're looking for or the place that you're looking for is covered by one of the maps. And then finally, Mix's catalog. I'll talk about each of these in turn. Our land records, this is one of our research topics. I mentioned that's one of the areas with, that you can explore via that research tab on the website. Under re that, the research topics, there is one called land records, where we talk about identifying patents and deeds, understanding state land acquisitions, and then the land appropriation. So the state's buying land, maybe for the forest preserve, or the state is buying land to build a highway, a park, or a canal. And then there are other resources that uh, will help you identify maps or other information on land records. Our real property pathfinder um, is a really rich and deep resource of how do you understand records about real property in various areas, the Dutch colonial period, after 1823 in New York State, Kings County or Brooklyn, New York City only, um, or recorded deeds and mortgages, which are have been digitized uh, by Family Search and are available through um, the state archives if you come to our research room. This is a really valuable resource for those who are just discovering how to find maps or how to find information on real property um, within the records that we preserve here at the state archives. I want to talk very briefly about Mix's catalog. If you're using historical maps in New York, Mix's catalog is an essential, essential resource. So the main index to these early maps, again, maps created prior to 1859, were cataloged by this guy, David Mix. That's why we call it Mix's catalog. It's the catalog of maps and surveys in the offices of the Secretary of State, State Engineer, State Surveyor, and Comptroller. The Mix's catalog is available for use here on site. It's also available on microfilm through interlibrary loan from the State Library, and the New York Public Library has a copy of the microfilm. Again, most of the records listed in this catalog are in the archives. Um, that in order to locate one, what the reference archivist really needs is the page number in the catalog in which the item appears. So if you use Mix's catalog to identify a map, communicate and contact the state archives and provide the page number so that we can identify what record series or group of records that particular map comes from. Mix's catalog, essential, essential resource. And again, I, I can't stress enough the importance of talking to an archivist, sending us an email, archref at nicid.gov, or uh, giving us a call at 518-474-8955 to help you explore your research question and help you explore the maps, the 80,000 plus maps that we have here at the State Archives. I'm gonna turn the, the microphone over to my colleague, Claire, who's gonna talk a bit about the Schilner maps and some Great. other things we're doing. Thank you so much. All righty, so that was informative to say the least. Thank you, Tom. Yes, part of my job here is to um, project manage a conservation project and digitization project of a unique set of maps here in the State Archives. 
And you've already heard the name. Um, Schilner is the group of maps. Uh, Schilner created the maps. And there's an image of his compass rows, which of course all maps have compass rows or should. Um, clearly, uh, anyone watching would know that the red line here indicates the Erie Canal. But it does, uh, as Tom said earlier, it really does impact most areas of the state. So it's just neat to see um, that's what we're going to be talking about, maps that document the Erie Canal. Um, this is a, a, an example of the beginning of a finding aid here at the State Archives, specifically the finding aid for the Schilner maps. The official name is the New York State Engineer and Surveyor Sectional Maps of the Erie Champlain and Oswego Canals. <clears throat> This is the front matter of the finding aid. So all finding aids will have this type of material. And here we can see reference finally to Schilner maps. Um, they depict land along the canals acquired by the state. Um, this is incredibly vast bunch of maps. We have 71 individual maps created by the engineer um, named George Schilner. Um, they were all created evidently in 1896. And as Tom mentioned quite a few times, um, the series number is the most essential way to access our materials. So if you're interested in Schilner maps, you will commit to memory B0253. That's our series. So we did receive funding to work on 20 of the 70, 71 Schilner maps. And the funding is provided by the Federal American Rest and Plan Act. So we always have to thank the taxpayers. And um, a number of other units have been very helpful. So I'll just mention the contracts administration units, fellow archivists, um, the conservator, a very key person here at the Office of Cultural Education who helped us examine these maps for a treatment potential. And you'll see at the end of our presentation, um, a number of fabricators in the State Museum, also in the same building with us, really helped us out. So Mr. Schilner, this is not him. This is an example of of a 19, late 19th century surveyor. So when you look at the maps, the Schilner maps, imagine George Schilner and his crew would have this exact type of material. Um, let's talk a little bit about the scale of the Schilner maps. I think picture is worth a thousand <laughs> words. This is one Schilner map. Uh, each one map is approximately six feet by seven feet. So, and they are hand drawn. Um, which I learned the term hand ruled. So you can get a glimpse of just the scope and scale of our maps. This is my favorite one with an archivist and a conservator stretching to reach the middle of the map. Okay. Um, Tom did a beautiful job describing features that are documented in the maps. So let's take a peek here at a Schilner map close up. This is an image, a rendering of one of the canals. And I'm pointing to two more or less parallel blue lines. Tom, can you tell us what those are? Uh, those blue lines are the right of way. Correct. Um, the right of way for the canal. And my understanding is that anything that falls between the blue lines is state property. Correct. Okay, good. All right. So uh, you Ooh. may hear, if you're doing any research on maps, you may hear of the blue lines. Now you know what that is. But look at just even though I can't interpret what this map says, it, there's a lot of information here, a lot of measurements, and a lot of work to say the least. And then you can see very gently little hand ticked um, double checking marks is what I imagine in pencil. Another um, example of what you see on the Schilner maps, Tom mentioned you can see uh, all kinds of features here. We see in blue the guard lock number one, clearly in or near the town of Phoenix, New York. We can see the blue lines, we can see the measurements, we can see indication of what buildings and roads. Um, so if you're interested in Phoenix, New York, this would be really fascinating. Or if you have reason to look at um, canal maps, uh, you could see some property Tom mentioned. We can see from the bottom left, Mr. Berkeley, Mr. Holman, the Ryans, Mrs. Wells, Mr. Harris, Mrs. Taylor, Mrs. Pratt, L. Montgomery and William Manis. There's also um, Fort Edward is way up in the upper left-hand corner. Um, and here's a detail that I really like on that particular map. You could see the canal running along the bottom in blue, part of the Erie Canal. 
But also, as Tom mentioned, the canals were moved and shifted and enlarged. So we can see here sort of like, uh, well, it's in a dotted line to indicate that it no longer exists, I believe. We see the old canal route. Um, and we can also see there's a cemetery, there's knife works and sewer works and all of this information on these maps. This is a lovely indication of the river. This is not the Erie Canal. This was actually the Oswego Canal. So you can see the river. And then to its left, you can see the um, canal blue line map running with all those measurements. So condition. I'll show you just a few images of the current condition of the Schilner maps. They are they're really quite filthy from um, surface grime, we call it. but. Uh, just wear and tear through the years. I mean, they're, how old are they? 1896 to 2023. So they, they're they still in use today, which is amazing. If a culvert breaks, a dam breaks, uh, there's a failure of some feature of the built canal, then I understand engineers actually come to the archives to consult these originals. So they're, they're not just quaint and beautiful renderings, they're still active, actively used. Okay, so here you can see a feature we call a tent. The paper is creased right along the middle, right along some information. Um, again, surface grime, you can see pinholes all along the edges. They must have been tacked up in some office at some time. There's some a close up of the edges. All of the edges are quite frayed and the actual paper material is separating from the linen or canvas background. There's a, that, that just hurts to look at, doesn't it? That is a plain old tear right through uh, the edge of the map that in addition to a tear being bad news, somebody endeavored to do uh, good work, but they used scotch tape or adhesive tape and taped up that repair. Tape is long gone, but the sticky residue has remained. And that's that, that awful brown um, staining that we see here. There's also quite a bit of loss of information, loss of material. Luckily, this is toward the edge of a map, but you, you get the sense of what we're looking at. Um, there's a, an indication that each map has an old vintage number tacked to the back, but also again, you can see um, down to the right, you can see all those fingerprints. And I think the conservator was wondering if some of them are in blood, and some are oil, some are field dirt, who knows? We could do a forensic study. Again, here you can see the surface grime, you can see a crease running up through the compass rows and uh, a tear here and there. So some condition is really bad and some is not as horrifying, but we did through the ARPA funding, we are able to, and through a bidding contract um, procedure with the state, we were able to invite the the bidder of um, the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts to perform the conservation work. There's their, their email and their phone number um, if anyone's interested in such work for your own stuff. So proposed treatment, I'll speed through this. Um, the Cons Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts, which I'll refer to as CCAHA, they wrote up a treatment proposal for each map and it includes all kinds of details. Um, relocating detached fragments, cleaning with vinyl erasers, mending the tears with mulberry paper, and uh, consolidating those split vertical creases and so forth with certain conservation materials. Once that's done, all 20 of these maps will be delivered to Innovative Document Imaging, idiimage.com, and they have the capacity to digitize these huge maps as one image. So six feet by seven feet is pretty hard to find. We, we found it difficult to locate digitizers who can do anything that big. Um, finally, we, the maps did leave the state archives last month. So I'll show you a couple images about the transportation. I did mention earlier that the museum fabricators were really helpful. This gentleman and his crew created inserts you could see those wooden he's holding an insert and each of the Schilner maps is wrapped around a tube so the insert would go into the tube and he made these custom crates for us which is really sweet so we thank the New York State Museum crew for that 
So this is um, these are the maps are not in this photo, but he was testing out the shape and size, and we did a lot of measuring and a lot of back and forth. Um, so 20 maps. Um, we brought these crates up to the state archive stacks, and these this crew of carpenters and fabricators helped us. Um, that's one of our cons conservation technicians in the back. Um, we had to load the 20 Schilner maps into these custom crates. You can see the wooden custom dowling or whatever you want to call it going into um, a map container, and that's a fellow archivist in the back there holding it. So it really does take a lot of people to move anything this big. And finally, each map was secured into position. I liken this to a wine rack, like a really gentle wine rack to carry our 20 maps from here to Philadelphia, where the Conservation Center is. And there's the crew with the 20 maps loaded up in the custom crates, which, good news, we're going to be able to keep those crates and reuse them for remaining Schilner maps if we get more funding to do that. And finally, here's an image of the crew and a driver from Innovative Document Imaging. Two crates are loaded up in an air-conditioned, custom, cool a little va um, van, and that's leaving through our loading dock. So when completed, the conserved Schilner maps will be returned to cool and secure storage here at the State Archives. The digitized maps can be made available on our website of primary sources and K through 12 lesson plans. Tom mentioned this earlier, we do have an education component. So I'd love for you to jot down that website, consider the source ny.org. And um, these maps, you can see there are some Schilner maps already on this website being used for classroom work um, lesson plans, but they're just snapshots that have been uploaded. Um, now, when these maps come back, they're, they're going to be so crystal clear and clean and mended, and it's going to be a real nice um, project. And finally, the digitized Schilner maps will be available for all New Yorkers, but also the world. And I think that's all we have. Claire, thank you. Yes. And I think that that last point that you make is really essential. Uh, the, the work that we're doing with these maps aligns with our commitment to making the re resources under our care ex accessible. And digital technology really makes that, that possible. So those Schilner maps that you're digitizing will, again, be available on our digital collections for download and use. You won't need to come to Albany. You won't need to get a, a group of archivists around to heft this enormous mm -hmm. thing and put it in the map room and see it. You'll be able to interact with it at your, at your home. Yeah. So, so that we've got a few minutes left. I think there might be a couple of questions in there, Josie. There are there are a few there are a few really good questions and thank you so much for that was a really informative presentation and beautiful beautiful maps. Um, so we have a question um, about the 1801 Simeon DeWitt map of the state that's printed in six or nine sections. Does anybody know anything about that map? I I don't know uh, anything specific about that map. But uh, if you send an email note to that ArcRef uh, mailbox that uh, I, I listed um, and ask for more information, it might even be on our digital collections, uh, but we can give you all the background that we have on that particular map. We're happy to do that. ArcRef at nyse.gov, A-R-C-H-R-E-F. Okay, and that might, um, we have another sort of um, specific question about where a person might find information about the Cannonsville Dam and the land that it submerged. The, those records will probably, again, be in both the Surveyor General and the State Engineer records. Um, and again, that's, that's probably where all that information is, especially if it was a state-sponsored project. The state would have had to approve it. Um, depends on when the, when the dam was built. Um, so that's that's an important factor. Again, with that kind of a specific research question, uh, contacting us at archref.nisa.gov or calling 518-474-8955 with a specific research question, the archivist will help you find where those records likely are. And they may be in a couple of different places. Uh, so uh, again, my uh, immediate assumption is that those records are probably under the um, uh, land commissioner's records 
again, depending on the time frame of when the Cannonsville Dam was built. Um, is there any work done on overlaying, um, you know, present day Google Maps on historic maps? There, that's a great, great question. And we are working with a colleague, I think I can say, his, well, we're working with a colleague who is doing exactly that, not necessarily Google Maps, but more, but modern maps and modern topography um, over the, the uh, Hutchinson maps. So he's using those Hutchinson maps and then overlaying or putting them, uh, putting them under the, the modern environment. So you'll be able to, again, use that to see where the canal and the structures around it in 1825 were, where they might likely be in 2023. It's a it, one of the things that we're fortunate to do here at the State Archives is we have the New York State Archives Partnership Trust, and they provide research fellowships to individuals who are doing you know, a deep dive in an important area. And one of our Hackman Research Fellows um, is doing this particular project. We're excited for this to be done. Um, and eventually those electronic maps will be online for all of us uh, to explore the Erie Canal of 1830 mm -hmm. uh, with today's eyes. Well, that's wonderful, wonderful news. Um, I think um, there are a couple more, you know, sort of specific research questions, and I'm going to, in just a moment, as soon as I'm done talking, um, put the the ArcRef email address into the chat so that if um, if anybody wants to copy that down, but again, it's A-R-C-H-R-E-F at nyse.gov, but I will put that in the chat. Um, but another question we have is, are there, do we have any examples of research projects that have been done with these Schilner maps yet? Um, I don't know that there's any specific projects done with the Schilner maps um, right off the top of my head. Most of the research has really been done about the construction of the canal. So, um, and again, the Schilner maps talk about the, the, the environment uh, that we're, we're dealing with. But you couple it with the minutes of the Board of Canal Commissioners. You couple it with the contracts for the construction of the canal and the details there. You couple it with the land acquisition and surveys, you know, the written out surveys. All of that put together helps provide the story and uh, of what, what the canal can, did in terms of how it interacted with the land and the property owners uh, adjacent to it. Okay, and we have um, another, I think, um, good question about, um, are the maps searchable for place names or personal personal names if if they're digitized are you able to search by those keywords or how does that work our name index is a way of getting to the maps usually it's through the letters patents or the land contracts the individual's name so using our name index can get you there um, but in many cases and i re referred to this at the very beginning um, many of these larger map collections where there's eight or 9,000 individual maps, there's a separate um, so, sometimes card file or card index that connects, that, that provides access to what map contains what feature or what place. Um, and that's where that information would, would be in many cases. So I wish there was one size fits all. Here's the one answer. But given the the nuances and the changes of what the maps were, why they were made, what kind of information they contain. You almost have to look at each individual map as its own sort of vertical and figuring out what does it have and now how do I get at the specific information in it. Can I add to that? Please. The, the Hackman research resident that Tom referred to is providing exactly that type of index for his work. So that's part of the product that we're going to see for that particular set of maps. Very valuable. That is valuable. Um, do you have any suggestions for funding for scanning local government maps other than the um, the local government records grants or suggestions for any universities that may have skilled interns to help with mapping projects? On the first, uh, of course, I immediately would go to our local government records management improvement fund, but for different kinds of map projects, if they're historical maps, there are a couple of different things that places that you can look. There's a couple of federal programs. Um, the National Historical Publications and Records Commission 
NHPRC, which is the grant making entity of the National Archives, has a small grant program um, and they would help support digitization, conservation of a, a set of maps. It's a competitive program, so you have to say why is, why, why is this important. Um, for larger scale projects, again, that have benefit to the humanities, the, the National Endowment for the Humanities also has a, an important grant making program, NEH, um, which would help support that kind of work. There's also through something called the Save America's Treasures program, which did receive funding under the, the, the current budget, um, which would support digitization of very unique and important records. Um, we've been a recipient of some of those records, but all of those programs are relatively competitive. Um, so you have to provide a good case. Why is this, uh, why does this need to be done? Okay, so there has been a lot of information presented today, and there we've had we have a lot of questions. Unfortunately, we can't get to all of them, but I do want to just let you know that for any kind of specific research question, the best place to start is to email that arcref at nyced.gov that I did I did pop that into the chat if anyone wants to look. And also, if you want to review, you want to watch this presentation again because you missed a piece of information that you really want. Um, it will, the recording will be available on our website. Um, it, it may take up to two weeks for us to get it up there, but you can go to nysarchivestrust.org and then you'll just click on online uh, events, online speaker series. And if you click on the past events, there will be a little button that you can click to watch now for all of our um, recorded conversations. So I, um, I also want to thank our speakers today, Tom Ruller and Claire Fleming, for all this wonderful information. And thank you to everybody who joined us. Um, and thank you for all your wonderful questions. And I hope that you all do um, contact a reference archivist to help you with those queries. It's our privilege to make these events available to you and to keep New York State's history alive. If you're interested in the content we create and you'd like to learn more uh, about what we do, please contact us at aptrust at nyse.gov. And as a bonus, you can receive a free past issue of New York Archives Magazine. And please join us on February 7th at 1230 for our next New York Archives on, uh, uh, Magazine online speaker series. That one's called A Bridge to Justice, The Life of Franklin H. Williams. Authors Enid Gort and John Carr will discuss their new book, which sheds a new light on the practical pragmatic bridge builder and brilliant yet complex individual whose life reflected the opportunities and constraints of an intellectually elite black man in the 20th century. And if you'd like to register for that event, again, you can visit our website at nysarchivestrust.org. Tom, Claire, thank you so much. And thank you to all of us who joined, all of you who joined us today. <laughs> I hope you all have a great day.